If you'll take your Bibles and turn over to Genesis chapter 24, I want to challenge you this evening here out of Genesis 24 about a char- the servant here of Abraham and the character traits this man had in his life. And you say, well, how is this really about missions? And I'm hoping to tie this all together and you'll see, you know, when we see this servant and his character traits in his life, why it's about missions. And, you know, it's not just a missionary that's going out and winning people of the Lord that's a missionary. Each one of you in the seat in here today are missionaries right here in Anchorage. Each one of you have the opportunity to reach people right here. You know, we think that the only people that reach people with the gospel are missionaries that go overseas or the pastor and the staff. You know, folks, the people that ought to be reaching people in their communities are sitting right here. You all are missionaries right here. And I'm so thankful for faithful people in churches and lay people in churches that come and that saw the need in the community in Foster Area, Michigan, that reached out to my family and got us into church, rode a bus, and, and I'm going to share that in a little bit, why I can stand here today and I'm going to New Zealand as a missionary because somebody cared about the people in their community enough to reach the people in their own community. But here I want us to look at some character traits of this servant and I want to I want to challenge you to think about your own life and the character in your life. Do you exhibit these character traits? Because if you don't have, if you don't have these character traits in your life, you know, you've got to have some kind of character or God's not going to use you. You know, you better have some kind of character. You know, what happens far too many times, we get in the ministry, we see men that end up in the ministry that don't have any character. And they end up out of the ministry. And they're not serving the Lord because they're not people of character. And folks, we all need to be people of character, not just a man that stands behind this pulpit and preaches, but every church member needs to be a person that has character in their life. You know, because there are other people looking at your life. Whether you think so or not, there's young people that watch your life every day. And whether you have kids in your home or not, it doesn't matter because you're sitting here in this church and all these kids are watching your life. I grew up in a church, and I know what it's like to sit in a pew and watch people's lives and, and to watch other people. And all these kids in this church are watching your life. And they're watching to see what kind of character you have in your life. And we'll get into this message, and then we'll talk about some of these character traits. But here, starting in Genesis chapter 24, starting in verse number 1, the Bible says, And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto the eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Preadventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land, must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest. And Abraham said unto him, Beware thou that thou bring not my son thither again. And the Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house, and from the land of my kindred, and that spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife and of my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son thither again. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master and swear to him concerning that matter. Let's have a word of prayer as we begin this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day we can meet together. And Father, we thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy in our country where we can still meet together like this. Father, many countries around this world don't have the freedom that we have here. And many times we take it for granted. Father, I pray that we won't take the freedom for granted you've given to us. That we would, as we were challenged earlier, pray for our country and for our leaders. And Lord, I pray that you would... Father, be with the message this evening. I pray that I wouldn't add to or take away from what you want said this evening. Father, I pray that you would speak to hearts this evening. Father, I pray that you would, Father, just challenge people tonight and maybe even this evening if there be one here that's struggling with full-time service or teaching a Sunday school class or whatever it is in their life, Lord, I pray that you would just encourage them to step out by faith and, Father, they do what you've asked them to do. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Here in this passage, we, we read about Abraham asking his servant to go out and find a, son, or a bride uh, for his son Isaac. And we know that he was successful in doing that. He was able to go out and find Rebekah and bring 
uh, her back. And, you know, as we read these verses here, it, as I read through verse number two, there was something in verse two that just kind of jumped out at me. And you might not think it's very much, but here it says, in the middle, it says, I ruled over all that he had. You know, this servant of Abraham ruled over all that Abraham had. He was a man, I believe, that speaks to his character of being somebody that was trustworthy. You know, he had enough character to be trustworthy. You know, in our uh, Christian circles today, in our churches today, you know what we need in churches are people that are trustworthy. You know, we need Christians that are trustworthy with the job that God's given us to do. You know, many times people say, well, I don't, I don't have anything that I can even think of that I'm supposed to be trustworthy in. Well, you know, if you're a husband, you have a wife, if you're a father, you have children. If you're a church member here, you have a church. If you're a Christian here, you've been given the Great Commission to go out and tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. And what God's given us to do and to take care of, are you trustworthy with those things that God has put into your hand? Are you a trustworthy servant? Are you that kind of servant that Abraham's servant is here, that Abraham could go to him and when he asked him to do something, he knew that this servant would do it? Folks, are you a trustworthy servant? You know, this servant here in these verses, as I uh, think about uh, verse number two, I kind of jotted down some notes that, you know, this servant was a man that had integrity in his life. You know, there was a day in this country where you could take another man by the hand, shake his hand, and agree on something, and you knew when you left that it would be done. You know, there was a day that you, you could actually say to somebody, hey, I'm going to come over to your house, I'm going to help you with this, it, it's going to be done, I'll bring this to you, and you know what? It would be done exactly like they agreed upon. And I, my grandfather, I grew up on a dairy farm there in Michigan, my grandfather's dairy farm, uh, my mom and dad worked, so my brothers and I worked down there, and we watched his life. My grandfather was very much that way. And if you said you were going to do something, you better do it. You know, and if you didn't do it, he had a size 12 boot, and he would come and find you, and you would do it. But, you know, he had, he was a man that had integrity. And, folks, we need to be people that have integrity in our life. Far too many times, even in churches today, it's, you know, we have to get out a nine-page paper to read through and have somebody sign it that, hey, you're going to do this, right? And I know some of it's for legal reasons. But, you know, we have to have paperwork to get somebody to do something. You know, it's got to be notarized. A lawyer has to sign it. All these things have to be done in order to get somebody to do something. Folks, be people of your word just by a handshake. Do what you say you're going to do. And can I challenge you parents and grandparents and people here, teach your kids that when you say something, you're going to do it. You know, make sure you follow through on keeping your word. You know, those younger generations, they learn that from us. And they're watching our lives to see, are we actually people that will keep our word? When we say we're going to do something, they're watching to see if you're going to do it. So every time you tell your kids something and you don't do it, it's teaching them the wrong thing. Be somebody that follows through on their word. Be a person of integrity. You know, this servant here, if we were to keep on reading past these verses, and for sake of time, I'm not going to read all the verses in the chapter. But we know that this man, he stopped and he prayed as he was getting ready to go on his journey to find this young lady. You know, as he stopped there and he took a moment, he prayed for God's guidance as he was getting ready to go on his way. Church, can I tell you, every day you ought to be praying for God's guidance in your life. Every day as you begin a new day, you ought to be praying for God's guidance, not once a week, every day as you get up, that God would guide you to a person that needs encouragement or a, a soul that needs to know Christ, that you would pray and ask God for guidance in your life. And this man, he stopped and he prayed and he asked for guidance. And, you know, here he asked very specifically in his prayers for God to do something. He asked for this young lady to come out and draw water, to give him drink and give his camels drink, and he prayed very specifically for a situation. Church, you need to pray very specifically for things in life. Far too many times we get busy about our day. We get hurried in the mornings and we don't take time to pray. Wednesday nights we come together. And I grew up in a church as a teenager in a Baptist church anyways. And as I was in that church and attended prayer meetings, I know the night would get away and then 
People would just take time to pray very generically for things and not pray specifically for things. Not pray specifically for people. Folks, we need to pray specifically so God can answer our prayers specifically. You know what that'll do for your heart? When you pray and ask God for something only he could answer that nobody else knew about, but you prayed a certain way and you saw God answer that prayer. Boy, what an encouragement it is to your heart when you see God answer that prayer just the way you prayed it. And we need to be people that pray specific prayers in our life. Don't be hurried about your day to not take time to pray. You know, each one of you in this room ought to be praying for each other. As a church, you ought to be praying for each other every day. In some form, maybe take a, alphabetically take a few people from the church and pray all week long for different people in the church. You know, you don't know what each other's facing from day to day in every situation in life. You know, a lot of times we're good at masking things on the outside and we don't show that something's going on and we come to church and we put on a smile and we attend, you know, we just go on like nothing's going on and then we walk out the doors and the pressure's there and things are going on and maybe health things or things in our family and we don't take time to pray for people like we ought to because you don't know what, you know, they're facing. You need to pray for them. You don't know what each other's facing. You know, and can I stretch that on out to missionaries? You need to pray for your missionaries. You know, you saw some of them that were mentioned today in the uh, testimony time, and you have your missionary displays on the back, and you have their prayer letters up there and their pictures. Do you take time just to walk by and look at your missionaries? Do you take time to pray specifically for them? Do you take time to read their prayer letters? Do you take time to pray for their kids? Folks, the kids are just as much of the ministry as mom and dad are. And the devil will find the weakest link in a family to attack. And what missionaries need are for you to not only pray for them, but to pray for their kids. Pray for their kids when they're out on the mission field. They've got to protect them. But be praying for each other. Be praying for your missionaries. Be people that pray specifically, not just generically. You know, we need to lift up our lost family members by name. Not just like, hey, Lord, be with all, the lost, all my lost family members that they'd come to trust Christ. You know, you know who your lost fam family members are. And you need to lift them up by name to the Lord. Be people that pray specifically in life. You know, I was over in verse number 34 as I was reading through this passage, and I come to this verse... And I thought about this man and his character. It says, and he said, I am Abraham's servant. And you may not think that that's much of a deal that, you know, he says he's a servant. But as I thought about this servant of Abraham, this man, he was willing to call himself a servant. Back in verse 2, we just read, he was the head of the house of Abraham over all of Abraham's stuff. He ruled over all of those things. God blessed under his care all of Abraham's possessions and in his family. And he could have very easily said when he come to this point, hey, I'm the head of the house of Abraham. But he didn't do that. He said, hey, I'm just, I'm a servant of Abraham. I'm just a servant. Folks, too many times we get around a water cooler at work and we say, hey, let me tell you about myself. Let me tell you about the accomplishments I've done. Let me tell you about how I climbed the corporate ladder. Let me tell you about all the points I scored in a game or whatever it may be without ever saying, let me tell you about my Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, we need to be a servant, like this servant here. We don't need to talk about ourselves. We need to get in those situations, and we've all been guilty of this, but we need to come to these points in time where God puts us and say, hey, let me tell you about what Jesus Christ has done for me in my life. It's not about Jerry Judd, it's about Jesus Christ. I'm just a servant. And folks, if you're a Christian here today, your attitude ought to be, I'm just a servant. We're just servants that God can use right here. If we're willing to let him use us, he will use us. You need to be a servant with a humble attitude. Far too many times we come into church and, you know, I've, 
been in places where, man, you can, you can just feel the attitude. You know, it's no humble spirit there. But you know, then you come in a place and it's like, man, I can feel a humble spirit here where God is using people here. And you can feel that here. That, you know, it's not about us, but it's about the Lord Jesus Christ. And keep your focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep your focus on him. We're just all servants that he can use. But, you know, as we come towards the end of this chapter, verses 54, 55, 56, we see here that this servant is wrapping up. He's got Rebecca. He's ready to go back. And as he's ready to leave, the family's saying, hey, hey, give us some more time with her. Don't, don't take off so fast. Just give us a few more days. Give us more time. And, you know, this servant here, he wasn't willing to give him more time. He was saying, hey, just let me go back to my master. And I believe he was showing the character trait of being someone who is a finisher. He was a finisher. He just wanted to finish the job. You know, many of the men in here, and, you know, if you've done any kind of construction or contracting or different things, you know, I believe many men in here have the mindset of being a finisher. Hey, I got a job to do. I'm on a schedule. This one I'm going to be done. It's going to be done. Let's get it done. And I believe that's the way this servant was. Once he had Rebecca, once he knew the job was done, it was finished. Let me just go back. I'm done. I want to get back to Abraham. I believe he wanted to go back and share with Abraham all that God had done and how that he answered his prayer and how he guided him on his way and how all these things were done to bring Rebecca to that point. And I believe he wanted to get back to share with Abraham all these things because he was a finisher. Folks, we need people in churches today that are finishers. You know, we need people, as we get older, many times we just kind of think, I can't go to church. And really, some people, they really can't get out. But, you know, sometimes it's just an excuse that I can't go to church. You know, or we get discouraged and we can't go. And, and you know, I, I was at a church as a teenager, and we had a pastor that committed sin, that ended up out of the ministry. In four weeks, I saw our church go from 350 to 200 people. 150 people left. Folks, are you, are you following the pastor or are you following the Lord Jesus Christ? Who should you be following? The Lord Jesus Christ, the pastor God put there to guide the church, and of course you're supposed to follow him as he follows Christ. But you know, folks, keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and be a finisher. Keep your eyes on the goal and on the prize. Far too many times we get our eyes off and on the wrong thing and we don't finish because we're looking at the wrong things in life. You know, your young people in this church need to see people that will show them that being a Christian is worth it and I'm going to stick it out through thick and thin. When tough times come, it's worth staying here at church. When difficulties come in life and it may be financially, it may be health-wise, there may be situations in your family, whatever it may be, but you know what? I'm not going to turn my back on Christ. I'm going to keep on moving towards the prize. Folks, be a finisher. This servant here has a character trait of being a finisher. To the very end, he wanted to finish the job he was given. Folks, finish the job you've been given. Stay on course. Some of you may be struggling even tonight about, man, I, I don't know if it's worth it. I don't know if it's worth sticking it out and being here and going to church, and I don't know if it's worth it. Stay on course. Stay on the track. You know, back in uh, 2008, I believe it is, I was watching uh, uh, something about a... a uh, Big Ten race, or was a, it was, a, I believe, 800-meter race, and there was four or five young ladies in that race, and the favorite was a girl from Minnesota, not Michigan or Ohio State, but, you know, <laughs> she was from Minnesota, and she was favored to win this 800-meter race. They got in the race, the gun goes off, they take off down the track, and she's in the lead with another girl right next to her. They get about the 600-meter point, and her feet get tangled with the girl next to her, and she falls to the track. And those girls are 20, 25 yards in front of her. You know, most of us would have said, there's no way I can win the race. I'm done. Just get up and 
jog to the finish line or maybe just get up and jog over to the side and say, you know what, I'm done, I, I can't finish. You know that girl through a difficulty in that race thinking that, you know, everybody else surely wrote her off that she lost. She got up off that track and in the last 200 meters, being 25 yards behind or so, she took off and she crossed that finish line with her foot in front of the other girl. She won by a few inches, but she won the race. Through a difficulty when everybody would have been looking and said, oh, you know what, she'll never finish, she won't win, she just lost. You know what, she got up and she finished the race. Folks, you may be going through a difficult time, but get up and finish the race. Keep on going. You know what, Jesus Christ said he'll stick closer than a brother. We have someone that can walk with us and go through life and through the difficulties. Man, I stop and think about the lost world and how do they deal with difficulties in life. I can never imagine how they can cope with things in this life. It's hard enough as a Christian to register things in your mind sometimes about what's going on and things that happen around you, and it's like, man, how is this even possible? But how in the world does a lost person deal with it? I'll never understand. And you have someone that said, I will go with you. Christ will go through everything with you. And he will. You know, as I shared these character traits tonight, I, I want to tie it together a little bit with my testimony. You know, as, as a young man growing up in Foster Area, Michigan, and some I talked to from Michigan kind of know where Foster Area Mayville is, but Foster Area, Michigan is a spot on the map. If, I, if you were to take a pencil and touch a map, that would be Foster Area, that little spot. But Foster Area is about 200 people. On the edge of that town sits a church today that runs about 350 people in a little community of 200. Farming community and, you know, people come in from all over. And I, I believe that it's there because of the people in that church that reached out to the people in their community and just showed them that they cared about other people. And I was one of those people that they reached out to as a kid as I was being raised at, about a half mile from the church. My family, we were Catholic. My mom and dad, we were the Christmas and Easter Catholics, but my brothers and I went to catechism every week. They, at the public school, the Catholic church would come pick us up the last hour, Tuesdays or Thursdays, take us down to the VFW hall. We had catechism there back to the school and home. But during those years of our life, you know, we were, our home was a real mess, as a, any home in the world usually is. Alcohol, you know, my dad was an alcoholic smoker. Uh, he worked at General Motors. And w when I say that my dad was abusive, he was not the kind of guy that came home when he was drunk and wanted to give you a hug. He was the kind of guy that came home and he would pull us off our bunks and try to bounce us like basketballs on the floor. That's the kind of alcoholic he was. But you know, through those years of my life as a young kid, going through this in life, and that was normal everyday life to us. You know, as we were going through that, we had some men from the Baptist Church right up the road from Foster A Baptist Church that knocked on our door on a Wednesday, Thursday night, invited us to church about 7 o'clock Thursday night as they had their visitation program every Thursday at 7, they'd be up there going out knocking on doors. And they knocked on our door that one night in the, I don't even remember what time of the year, it was probably uh, late uh, fall, early summer or winter. Um, but they'd come and they'd knock on our door. And then my parents would say, hey, we're Catholic, we're not interested, you know, thanks for coming anyways. They'd say, thank you. They close the door next Thursday night. They just want to invite you to church. It was a pastor of the church, Fred Kinkle, a little short, white-haired guy. If you were to see him preach, that guy would turn as red as a beet. You thought he was going to die with that snow-white hair up there. It's like, man, he's going to have a stroke. But, you know, I, that's the way he was. And Pastor Kinkle and a man by the name of David Smith would come to our home and invite my parents to church. David Smith went to school with my mom and dad. They graduated around the same time, so they knew each other from high school in that area. And my parents told him again that night, no thanks, we're Catholic. The next Thursday night came and they knocked on our door again, invited us again. You know, this went on for weeks, weeks, and weeks. 
them knocking on our door, inviting us to church until finally my mom said, you know what, Dave, I know you drive the Sunday school bus. You go right by our house. Why don't you pick the boys up and take them to Sunday school this week? So David Smith picked us up that first Sunday. We went to Foster Ray Baptist Church. We went in that church, went to Sunday school and junior church, come home. My mom said, how'd you guys like it? Man, we loved it. We played games and we had candy. At catechism, we don't play games. They don't give us candy. We don't want to go back to catechism. My mom said, hey, whatever you guys want. If you don't want to go back to catechism, you don't have to. You can go to the Baptist church from now on. So we started riding that Sunday school bus going to the Baptist church. You know, at catechism, they never told me I was a sinner. They never told me that Jesus Christ died for my sin. They just told me, be a good person, and maybe you'll make it. You know, when I got to that Baptist church, I can remember the day that I trusted Christ my Savior. Mrs. Straw was standing up here in the front in the junior church class, and she had the old flannel graph set right here. And she was taking those pieces and sticking them on the board, and she was talking about the death, burial, and resurrection around Easter time. And she was talking about what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross of Calvary. For the first time in my life as a kid, I understood what Jesus Christ did for Jerry Judd because he was a sinner. And he didn't deserve heaven, but Christ paid the price that I could go to heaven. For the first time in my life, I understood. I went forward to Mrs. Strahl after the junior church class. I said, Mrs. Strahl, I need to trust Christ as my Savior. And she took me into the classroom with a couple other kids. And I bowed my head and prayed and asked Christ to come into my heart and to save me from my sin. You know, both my brothers did the same thing that Sunday in different classes. We went home. My parents were... Uh, they basically, <laughs> we said, hey, we got to save the church today. Well, what does that mean? I don't even know what that means, but that's okay. It's good. So my parents didn't even understood what, didn't understand what we did. You know, but it, through time, my parents began to see people that cared about their kids. Because those people at Foster Baptist Church on Saturday morning started visiting our home and started reaching into our home through me and my two brothers. I'm the oldest of three. And we're all a year apart, so we fought like cats and dogs, as brothers do. So, but my mom and dad saw that church reaching out, showing some love to three boys that the world cared nothing about. You know, Saturday morning, they'd come up and they'd say, hey, make sure you're doing your lessons, bring your Bible, you know, and uh, do your memory verse, and you get more points, and you win bigger candy bars. And I'm all about bigger candy bars. King size are the best. So anyways, we were in these classes and learning verses and doing these things, my parents became interested in why do these people care so much about our kids. And I saw my parents come up to church on, a, on Sundays. They would come. Church would start at 11, the main service, and they would come at 10 after 11, hoping nobody would see them slip in the back of the auditorium. And then when the pastor would say, by your heads and close your eyes, they'd be the first two headed out that door. But there was always a man by the name of David Smith to meet my folks in that lobby and say, thank you for coming today. And if there's any questions we can answer, feel free to ask. You know, I saw my mom and dad come for a few weeks like that, and eventually I saw my mom and dad get saved at Foster A Baptist Church. When I say there was a change that was made in our home, it wasn't because of AA, it was because of Jesus Christ. And I saw my dad dump his alcohol down the drain and throw his cigarettes out, and he quit beating on us, and he started to love us instead of started hitting on us. And there was a great change that was made in our home because of Christ. But it was because people cared enough to reach your own community. Folks, do you care enough to reach your own community? Do you care enough to reach the folks here in Anchorage with the gospel of Christ? I'll guarantee you there's kids out here that are facing the same thing I did as a kid. And maybe some of you faces when you were a kid. And are you, do you care enough to reach those families with the gospel of Christ? You know, many would look and say, man, I'm not getting involved there. It's not worth it. I don't want to get involved in that mess, all that drama and all these things. You know what? Sometimes life is messy. But I can give them a book that can show them how to clean up the mess. And you can point them to Jesus Christ. And you'll see some of these folks come to trust Christ as their Savior and their life changed and come to church and one day with their kids or they themselves be standing in front of you saying, you know what, God called me to be a missionary to go serve him on a foreign field. I'm so thankful for faithful people. 
folks, are you faithfully serving the Lord? It's not just a missionary or a pastor that needs to have these character traits in his life. It's every church member. I've already mentioned Dave Smith's name. David Smith is a man that God used in my life greatly. He wasn't a pastor, an evangelist. He was just a faithful man in our church that served the Lord in different areas, from a deacon to a Sunday school superintendent to picking up kids on the bus. And David Smith still picks up kids on that Sunday school bus every week. Obviously, it's not the same bus. That one's rusted out, being in Michigan, but it's a different bus. But he's still faithfully serving the Lord, reaching his community for Jesus Christ. Folks, we all can be a church member like David Smith. We all have the opportunity. What are you going to do with the opportunity? I have a saying written in the front of my Bible that says there's two things you can do with your life. You can give it away or you can throw it away, but you can't keep it. Folks, what are you going to do with your life? Are you going to give it to the Lord, let him use you right here in Anchorage to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, or are you going to throw it away on the things in this world? Are you going to use it to change a life for eternity? Are you going to use your opportunity to affect a young man or young lady that one day could be a teacher or just a faithful member in a church serving the Lord reaching other young people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Folks, you have an opportunity. What are you going to do with it? I pray that as we talked about these different character traits of the servant, as we went through these, that you thought about your own life. Man, are we the people of prayer like we ought to be? Are we that person of integrity like we ought to be, that trustworthy person? Are we this person that has a humble spirit, this person that's a finisher? Do we have these things in our life? Folks, I want to finish my race. And I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I pray that you want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Then you need to be a finisher. Folks, what are you going to do with your life? Are you going to use it up on, for God or are you going to throw it away on the world? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes tonight as we close in prayer. I'm going to ask a couple of questions and turn it over to Pastor. Maybe tonight you're here and you'd say, you know what, Brother Judd, maybe I've never trusted Christ as my Lord and Savior. And tonight I would like to have someone take a Bible and show me from God's Word how I can know for sure if I were to die today that I'd go to heaven. If you're like that here this evening, I don't want to point you out, but I'd like to pray for you. Is there anyone here like that this evening? Say, we'd like to... You'd say, I'd like to have someone take a Bible and show me how I can know for certain about eternity. Maybe tonight you're here and you say, you know what, Brother Judd, maybe in my life the Lord has spoken to me about something in my life. Maybe it's about one of these character traits in my life. Maybe it's about my opportunity to reach my community with the gospel of Christ. But if the Lord has spoken to you in some way this evening, just by raising your hand, I'd like to pray for you. Is there any like that here this evening? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day you've given to us, Lord. I thank you for the opportunity to be, able, to be able to come and hear your word preached. And Father, I thank you for uh, your word and the way it works in our lives and changes us. And Father, I pray that you would be with those this evening that have raised their hand. And Father, that have expressed that you've spoken to them in their heart. And Father, we, uh, we don't know, but you know how you've spoken to them. And Lord, I pray that you would just uh, encourage them and help them in whatever area of their life that you've spoken to. And Father, to make decisions that would honor you and glorify you. And Father, to reach their community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. Father, again, if there be one here that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, that if that's someone here tonight, that before they leave, that they would allow us to take a Bible and show them for certain how they could know that they'd have a home in heaven. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray.